Very. Uh, can you guys just confirm that you're seeing the Torah blessing? Okay, you are, so that's good. I'll make it a little bit bigger. So we're going to be studying from the middle uh, of the Bible, from the section of the prophets. So technically it's not Torah, but as I described before, Torah is a much bigger word. Uh, and so it's, it counts as for the Torah blessing because we are studying sacred text. So let us say the blessing together in Hebrew and in English. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav, Vitzivanu Lasok B'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who sanctifies us with the commandments and commands us to engage in words of Torah. Uh, and now, friends, let us go to Elisha and Naaman, the leper general. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, this story takes up all of chapter 5. We're going to read only the first 19 verses of it because it has like an addendum, like a, an added on end of the story there. But, you know, it's just too much. Uh, this is plenty for us to deal with in our 20 minutes allotted. So what is 2 Kings? Um, well, uh, 2 Kings is uh, really the second half of a single book. In Jewish tradition, Kings, first and second Kings, is just one book. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, it's just one book. But uh, in Christian Bibles, it's two books. They just took the book and they divided it uh, into two. Is probably, uh, and in fact, the tradition of it being written on two different scrolls we know goes back to the time of the Septuagint. And even in early, in early Christianity, they counted it as two books, the first and second Kings. Uh, but in Jewish tradition, we maintain that it was one book, one book, it's one book, even as late as the 16th century, uh, Jews continue to refer to just as this one book. So for, a, you know, for about, you know, for 1,600 years of Jews living among Christians, we stayed fast. It's one book, it's one book. And finally, we gave up. I'm like, okay, first, second king, fine, just so people know what we're talking about. Um, so it's second Kings chapter five, but you and I really know there's only one book of Kings. It just, it, it, they just could, they couldn't fit it all in one scroll. So they wrote it on two scrolls, but it's just, it's one book. Uh, in fact, even the book of Kings isn't its own book. It's really part of Samuel. It's really first and second Samuel, first and second Kings are really all part of one work. And frankly, they're part, it's really, they're all part of a much greater work that starts with Deuteronomy and continues through with the book of, uh, you know, Joshua and Judges uh, and First and Second Kings. It's really all part of one big work of one cycle. Um, and in this book, we're going to learn uh, in, you know, First and Second Kings. We're going to learn about King David. We're going to learn about, uh, or the end of King David. We're going to learn about King Solomon. We're going to learn about Elijah and the beginning of the split dynasty and our hero, the prophet Elisha. Uh, when was it written? Um, you know, it seems that it was started before the Babylonian exile, but there's definitely components that uh, reference the Babylonian exile or that, 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 that definitely have it in mind. So it was probably started uh, in the 7th century before the Common Era and completed in the 6th century before the Common Era. So how old is this text? It's 2,600, 2,700 years old. This particular story is hard to date because even though Naaman is referred to by name and Elisha is referred to by name, the kings that they are talk about in the story are not referred to by name. So we don't know which kings are going on here, which make it uh, less historical and likely as a, as a history and really more of a story of moral uh, lesson uh, about, uh, you know, to teach, you know, and you'll see there is a moral tale in it and also show how awesome Alicia is with the, you know, with his wisdom and his miracles. Um, so without any further ado, let us read about Naaman. So again, a little backdrop, Naaman is a general of Aram or the Arameans. Arameans were a more powerful nation just to the north of Israel and Judea or Samaria and Judea. Um, they were in, in present day Syria is where they were. 
Um, Damascus was their major city. Um, and so they would be to the north of us and more powerful. We were not at war with them, but we were uh, in, uh, we were, uh, I guess we would be deferential to them uh, at this time at the basis of the story. So my friends, um, should we get readers or should I, um, uh, or should I just read for, I'll just read. Okay, uh, I'm seeing some people pointing, so I think I'll, I'll read. Okay, so Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was important to his lord and high in his favor, for through him the lord had granted victory to Aram. But the man, though a great warrior, was a leper. Once, when the Arameans were out raiding, they carried off a young girl from the land of Israel, and she became an attendant to Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish master, referring you know, to the, to the general Naaman, I wish master could come before the prophet in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Samaria, by the way, is the Northern Kingdom of Israel. It's just a, a, a synonym. Um, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, go to the king of Israel and I will send along a letter. He set out, that is Naaman, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 changes of clothing. By the way, 10 changes of clothing could mean that he was a really fancy guy, that he was showing, you know, that he would wear a new outfit every day, which was not common. Most people in ancient times had an outfit and you would wear it every single day. Or it could be he was bringing payment to the, he, and in addition to all the gold, the clothing would be part of the payment, the gift that he would offer the miracle man to cure him of his leprosy. He brought the letter to the king of Israel. It read, now when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent my courtier Naaman to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he rent his clothes and cried. Am I God to deal death or give life that this fellow writes to me to cure a man of leprosy? Just see for yourselves that he is seeking a pretext against me. All right. So this sets up the drama. The general with leprosy arrives with a letter from the king saying, I've sent you my beloved general so he can be cured of leprosy and the king of Israel is terrified. I will open up the floor for a moment to ask you, my friends, if anyone wants to raise their hand, why is the king terrified? What, 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 what's going on? Why does he say he's setting me up? Did anyone understand this and can explain to the others? Go ahead and just, uh, all right, Dan, unmute yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, there's no guarantee he's going to be able to cure him. And he figures, well, this is a, a way they can get rid of the king of Israel. They'll just say, you got to cure this guy. Or, you, know. you didn't do it. Or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not only is there no guarantee he's going to cure the guy, he's got no chance. He's like, I've been set up. I've been okay. sent with this letter. I can send this guy. Oh, you know, here, go cure my general. Thanks. And he's like, uh, this is a ruse. He's seeking a pretext against me so that he could go to war um, and attack me because I didn't do his bidding, but I can't. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you rent your clothes? Let him come to me and he will learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Elisha says to the king, don't worry. I got this. So Naaman came with his horses. Oops, there's people in the waiting room. Let's see if we can let them in. All right, so Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him to say to him, um, oh, I'm sorry, hold on, let me show the whole thing. So Naaman came with horses and chariots and halted at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go and bathe seven times in the Jordan, that's the River Jordan, 
and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. clean. But Naaman was angered and walked away. I thought, he said, he would surely come out to me and would stand and invoke the Lord his God by name and would wave his hand toward the spot and cure the affected part. Are not the Amana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, are they not better than all the waters of Israel? I could bathe in them and be clean. And he stalked off in a rage. All right? So just to make sure you're following along here, the guy goes on this long journey. He gets to the door of Elisha, who had summoned him, told the king, I got this. And Elisha doesn't come out of his house. He sends a messenger, says, go bathe in that river seven times. Now, if you've been to the River Jordan, and you know the glorious River Jordan of our Bible and the heritage and the Black Gospels, the River Jordan, and then you get to the River Jordan and you realize, uh, one second, I went out of focus. I'm going to see if I can uh, fix that. Uh, well, I'm out of focus. Uh, you get to the River Jordan, you realize it ain't much. Uh, Mark Twain wrote about his terrible disappointment of seeing the River Jordan on his journey. Uh, it's just a stream. And it's like, you know, and that's how uh, Naaman sees it. He's like, this is nothing. There's better rivers in Syria. And he's furious. And he's ready to storm off in a huff. And my friends, that is going to be bad for Samaria, bad for Israel. But his servants, Naaman's servants, came forward and spoke to him. Sir, they said, if the prophet told you to do something difficult, would you not do it? How much more so when he said, only said to you, bathe and be clean? Okay, so he went down and immersed himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had bidden. And his flesh became like a little boy's, and he was clean. Returning with his entire retinue to the man of God, he stood before him and exclaimed, Now I know there is no God in the whole world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. But he replied, that is, Elisha replied, As the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept anything. He, Naaman, pressed him to accept, but he, Elisha, refused. And Naaman said, then at least let your servant, servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will never again offer up burnt offering or sacrifice to any god except the Lord. But may the Lord pardon your servant for this. Okay, so let me explain this. Now he's saying, Naaman is saying, Please let your Lord pardon me, your servant, for this, what I'm about to explain. He, Naaman, says, when my master, the king, enters the temple of Rimon to bow low and worship there, and he's leaning on my arm, because, you know, he's the number one general, he's the right-hand man, if he's leaning on my arm so that I must bow low in the temple of Rimon, when I bow low in the temple of Rimon, May the Lord pardon me, your servant, in this. And he, Elisha, said to him, go in peace. My friends, that is, I'm going to remove the spotlight uh, and go to gallery view. And you're welcome to go uh, to gallery view or stay in speaker view. That's your choice now. That is the story of Naaman, the leper general. And we've only got a few moments now. Um, so open up your commentary. What intrigues you about the story? Why do you like the story? What did you read into the story? And anyone want to guess why it is the rabbi? Why, why do I love this story? Well, it seems like it was one of the first conversions. Yeah, and conversion stories are super uh, excellent vehicles to make your point. Because if even the enemy, like Balaam, you know, who's there to curse Israel, if even the enemy sees how great we are, that's how great we are. If even the enemy recognizes that God is the one true God, God's the one true God. So it's a great vehicle. 
um, of affirming that our Lord is the Lord, because um, even the enemy general knows it. Quietly, when he's standing next to his king, bowing low at the temple of Rimon, he's bowing, saying, forgive me, Lord, of that tiny little backwater country called Israel. I know you're the one true God. And yes, it is a conversion story as well. Uh, I, you're right. I took a cynical approach, and Ike, you took a more positive approach. <laughs> it is a conversion story uh, of acceptance of belief. Uh, Dan Aminoff. And it also seems, just like Dickens will use certain names to hint at things, Naaman, you can almost say, is please believe. So when a prophet says something, please believe him. doesn't matter if you're a king or a general believe what the prophets say. Yeah. And Naaman almost didn't. Naaman was ready to storm off in a huff and probably kill a few thousand Israelites with him. I mean, like, he was mad. And frankly, he had reason to be. I will reveal another reason why I love this story. It's so ballsy. Elisha, by the way, Elisha was the... Um, you know, the servant of Elijah, and he's the successor of Elijah. And one thing he learned from Elijah is extraordinary arrogance and showmanship in his arrogance. You know, we think of these uh, prophets as, as pious, you know, servants of God, and some of them were, but some of them were like, you know, were that guy, you know, were really like, uh, and, and that woman too, because Deborah was also, um, it's hard to say ballsy with Deborah, but you understand what I'm saying. She also had that sort of um, uh, bravado um, and understanding that she was really all that. Um, that's what Alicia does here. You know how like in movies, you know, that cliche where they set off an explosion and the hero's like walking away and the explosion happens behind the hero and they don't even turn around and look. That's what Alicia did. Like, not only did he not come outside and greet him, he said and did his miracle and he wasn't even there. He stayed in his house just to go bathe in there. The miracle happened. He didn't even leave his house. Man, that's like, dang. He really like, he just showing off and it's impressive. It's like, not only can he do miracles, he stays on his sofa and does miracles. Like he didn't even go outside. He's awesome. And if you're a reader in ancient Israel, you're like, whoa, Alicia, wow. That's my guy. Toby Halpern, your hands up, your turn, please unmute. Maybe I need Steve Hiller to help me with this as well as you, Rabbi. Isn't leprosy contagious? So in this case, there's different kinds of leprosy and we probably shouldn't call it leprosy because leprosy is a specific medical diagno diagnosis today. But in ancient Israel, that the word is probably referred to as a skin affliction. And there were different kinds. Some skin afflictions we learned from Leviticus render you outside the camp because they're super contagious. And some of them let you just, you're, you're fine. And he clearly had one that allowed him to do his job because he was leprous throughout even though he served as a general. So he had an okay kind of skin affliction. Because if you were a leper, would you go before a king? Again, it, he was not the kind of leper that would send you outside the camp and away from others. He was the kind of skin affliction that it was that you could be uh, among others by definition. Otherwise, the story doesn't work. Right. Actually, these days we don't call it leprosy at all. We call it Hansen's disease. And it's caused by a bacillus called Hansen's bacillus. Right, but the biblical term leprosy would be a exactly. broad category exactly. that would include Hansen's disease and any other skin affliction that would give you white scales or other, you know, or other things. So it's not a medical term. Uh, it's a category. Maybe uh, Frank. The other thing is that he didn't accept the gift or the payment. That's, that's what's so, you know, about this guy, right? It meant yeah. nothing to him. He, he didn't want the payment. And, uh, 
and he wanted something bigger. He, he wanted not a man and, um, and got him. Uh, and, or maybe he figured, you know, his payment was, was beneath him. Uh, friends, we're just about the end of our time on the story. So I want to share with you just a couple more things uh, that are so neat about the story. Um, one is the farce. The great heroes, excuse me, the great important people of the story all know they're all wrong and they all have to be corrected or shown the way by their servants. It happens over and over again in the story. It's like right out of Shakespeare. It's right out of, um, I don't know, like uh, remains of the day, you know, like where you have these sort of bumbling lords and it's, but it's really the servants who, who know how to handle, you know, and take care of everything. Think about it, Naaman was ready to leave and his servant said, no, 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 stay. Um, the Naaman thought he was gonna be stuck with leprosy, but it was this, that, that captive girl who knew that Alicia could, could so, you know, fix leprosy. And so she told the wife and the wife told the husband, everyone of lower status is telling the people up and the king of Israel didn't know what that girl knew. That girl knew that Elisha fixed his leprosy. The king of Israel didn't even know it. And he's like, ah, we're all going to die. But even the little girl knew. And uh, so you have like this socioeconomic class struggle where the heroes are all the servants who, and the, the oblivious idiots are the kings and the generals. And finally, one last thing. Um, well, two things. Um, the, the, what the servant said to Naaman, had he asked you to do something hard, you would have done it. So do something easy, right? Think about how foolish we can be when sometimes this, this simple, easy answer is right in front of us. You know, we go through great lengths, um, you know, to you know, to take statins and get our things checked or whatever. If we just like ate more vegetables, you know, and less red meat, like, you know, like, it, but we want to do something much more dramatic, uh, you know, instead of the really simple thing. Um, it, that's in the story and so well. And finally, Naaman himself. I loved the end. I love the honor, the wisdom, Naaman means a faithful one. And he's going to be faithful to the God of Israel. And he knows that even though he has to act out and bow to a foreign God, he's like, forgive me, but know that I'm true. And he just sets off in his way. And it's like, wow. And for the rest of his life, he's going to live this way, this quiet, secret honor and dignity. And no one will know except him and Alicia. It's awesome. Friends, that's segment one. We, I went over a little bit and I wanna say I am sorry. We're gonna resume in one minute with Rabbi Sheffron. If you need to run and fill up your uh, coffee or get your uh, whatnot. Um, oh, let's let a few more people into the room who just arrived. If you're getting coffee, I take mine with cream and sugar, please. <laughs> That was fun, Rabbi, thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're 30 seconds away from our next segment. You're welcome to chit chat if you want to say hi to anybody. I wanna say Chag Sameach to Rabbi Everett Gendler. Everett, it's so nice to have you here. Chag Sameach. Oh, uh, look at Ellen Ingalls. She brought Moses and the tablets. Hold on, you gotta see this, everybody. Yes. <laughs> Do you stick that into cheesecake? <laughs> no, it, it's like a flat Stanley that our Jewish RV group has. I it's love a flat, it. flat Moses. It's a flat Moses. That's outstanding. <laughs> All right. Is our minute up? Is it time? Let's begin. 
Uh, friends, I'm very, very, very excited to share with you um, some fun stuff tonight. It has nothing to do with Charlton Heston, uh, but you know that felt appropriate for Shavuot upon receiving the Torah. Um, friends, what I really wanted to just uh, do is, you know, as you may know, sometimes when I teach a text, it's really so that I can tell you one of my favorite bad jokes. Right? I, I, we, the, t the text is really just an excuse to tell the joke. Um, so I'm going to tell a joke that I'm sure you've heard. And if you haven't, you can just pretend because you'll hear it again at some point. Um, but I want us to look at the joke in a different way tonight than we may have ever looked at before. Uh, to look at some texts that I love. Um, and I couldn't even just hold it in with just one. I had to do two. So there's two texts associated with this joke. So the joke, because jokes are always funny when you have to explain them, right? So we're going to hear the joke and then explain it and then we're going to talk about the texts which is always made, makes things entertaining so this chag i want to share with you a classic uh, a rabbi starts at a new congregation and he's there leading friday night services and they get to the part in the service where the shema happens and half the congregation is standing up and half the congregation is sitting and halfway through the shema all the ones that are standing start looking at the ones that are sitting and they start yelling at them, get up, get up. People have been dying with the words Shema on their lips for a thousand years. You need to stand up. And everyone that's sitting says, no, 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 no. You need to sit down. The Shulchan Aruch says that if you're already sitting, you stay sitting and they argue like this. And the rabbi's shocked. The next Shabbat comes around and the same thing happens. A third Shabbat and once again it happens and, and he's going nuts. He doesn't know how to deal with this congregation all yelling at each other whether you stand for the Shema, you sit for the Shema. And he hears through the rumor mill that there's this uh, one guy who lives like a block and a half from the shul. He's 104 years old. He's one of the founding members of the temple and he goes to pay him a visit. And he sits in front of him and he says, you know, Art, uh, you, you're 104 years old. You were there when the shul started. I need to know what the tradition is. I said, you know, is it the uh, the people that are standing, the ones yelling at the ones sitting, are, are they the ones? He says, that's not the tradition. And the one that's sitting, are they, they're yelling at the ones that are standing up. Is that the tradition? That's not the tradition. So what's the tradition? He says, that they're yelling at each other and arguing and no one gets along and it's ridiculous, right? Like I said, you've heard the joke. We often tell that joke about arguing. It's often about how we just do what we do and it's ingrained in us and it's, it is how it is. And then we argue about it because we're Jews, right? This is the classic two Jews, three opinions. But I want to look at it from a completely different perspective tonight. Tonight, I want to look at it from, wait a minute, do we actually sit or stand during the Shema? The answer is yes. Right? And for many of you, I'm sure that you come from congregations where uh, you used to sit during the Shema and then you came to Temple Emmanuel and you stand during the Shema. And then there's those of you who came to our congregation and was like, oh, thank God they stand during the Shema, right? So I have a feeling that a part of the reason this joke is so famous and has been told so many thousands of times throughout uh, our people is because of a text that is found in the Talmud. So I want to share that text with you and see if we can deduce some fun things from it. And then hopefully I'll have time to share another text with you uh, that has a similar uh, but simultaneously important uh, message. Can you all see my screen? Do you see the text that says BT Brachot 11A? Hooray, I see nodding heads. Yes. I like nodding heads. They're fun. All right, friends. So we're going to walk through this text a little bit slowly uh, so that you can be sure to follow along. And before we actually start with the text, so don't read ahead yet. I should have waited 30 seconds to put it up. There are two things that I want to make sure that you are aware of. Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. You've heard their names before. Beit Hillel is who we tend to follow because generally Beit Hillel is the school of Jewish thought that's a little bit more lenient. And Beit Shammai is, you know, Hillel's study buddy, who tends to be a little bit stricter and we don't follow as much, but every now and then, that's one. And two is the reason that there's this constant argument about the Shema actually comes in Ve'ahavta. If you think ahead, like a verse, right? When we say the Shema, we usually follow it with Ve'ahavta. And, you know, it's uh, we put these on the doorposts of your house and on your gates and you think of them on your way. Love God with all of your heart. All these beautiful instructions that take us through our lives. But it also says when you lie down and when you rise up. 
So the Talmud is going through an argument. The rabbis are arguing, well, do I say the Shema when I'm lying down? Or do I say the Shema when I'm rising up? Or do I do it at both? So there's a good argument that says when you say the Shema in the evening, you actually say it laying down, like sitting down or laying down, reclining. There's an argument that says you'd say it when you're standing up, when you rise up, right? And this is actually one of the foundational pieces where we get this understanding that we stand for the Shema at Temple Emmanuel. This is some of the original stuff. So it's taught in the Baraita that our rabbis, our ancient sages taught that Beit Hillel says, standing, sitting, reclining, walking on the road, or at one's work. That the rabbis, they remind us that Beit Hillel taught that you can say the Shema anywhere at any time, in any position, anytime, right? You could be driving in your car, you could be on the horseback, you could be laying in bed, you could be, you can be anywhere in any position, right? Standing, sitting, reclining, walking, or at one's work. Even at your job, when you're working and you're having a long day, say the Shema, it's all good, right? You can stop to do your evening prayers, you can stop to do your morning prayers, you can say the Shema. And then I added in the parentheses, just for clarity, as opposed to Beit Shammai, who holds by that line in Ve'ahavta, that you should only recite, recite the Shema, our, the watchword of our faith, while reclining. You should be sitting. In fact, you should be like really comfortable, right? When you lie down and when you rise up. So he, Beit Shammai says you do it when you're lying down. We're following? Great. A typical Talmudic argument, right? Which way do we do things? And of course, we're going to have multiple opinions. So then the Talmud tells a story about once Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Eleazar ben Azariah were resting at the same place. They were, sorry, one second, let me resume this in the right way. I'm just trying to change my screen. I'm looking at all the wrong stuff. This is better. Ah, this is so much better. Now I can see the text. I see less Stephen Hiller and more text. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Um, so Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Eleazar ben Azariah were resting at the same place. Like we can imagine that they with some of their students were like on a road trip. They pull over for the night. They're like at the diner at, you know, near the hotel. And like there's 20 students and two teachers crammed into a couple hotel rooms and they're there for the evening. And it comes time. They're finishing their evening meal, let's say. And it comes time for the evening prayers. So what happens? Well, Rabbi Ishmael's like, you can imagine sitting on a couch, kind of leaning back, you know, sort of as if he's laying down. Uh, I just finished a nice meal. And Rabbi Eleazar ben Azariah is standing upright because it's time for the evening prayers. So we see our, our, our two uh, heroes in the story who are our known buddies. They are rabbis who love to argue with each other. Uh, the Talmud tells us that uh, Rabbi Eleazar ben Azariah is Rabbi Ishmael's greatest um, provoker. Like he's constantly pushing him that they have this great study relationship. And, you know, but obviously they're friends. They travel together with their students, so they get along well. So uh, it's in the first century. I don't know how nice the Holiday Inn was and how nice the Howard Johnson meal place was, but they had their meal. So we're going to move on to the text. So the time comes for reciting the Shema. And Rabbi Eleazar ben Azariah, who was the one standing he reclines. And then Rabbi Ishmael, he stands up, he stands upright. So the two of them, they're doing the opposite of what the opposite was, of what the other one was doing and the opposite of what they were just doing. And Rabbi Eleazar ben Azaria, who was the one who was standing and then laid down, says to Rabbi Ishmael, my brother Ishmael, my holy brother, my, my, my study partner, I'm going to tell you a story about what I just witnessed. Let me tell you a parable. And he asked this question. What is this like? What is our conduct like? What do we just do? And he says to him, it's like a man, a man that someone says to them, to whom people say, you have a fine beard, right? We, we, we know what a nice beard looks like, groomed and trimmed and perfectly sculpted with maybe some nice oil in it. Like imagine like a good beard. And he replies, the man replies with a nice beard. You think my beard's so nice? Let this go to meet the destroyers, meaning... You like my beard so much, I'm cutting it off and I'm getting rid of it. Whoever wants to destroy my beard can destroy it, right? Like you can't take a compliment. You can't do what's good. You can't do what's right and nice. It's quite a, quite a parable, no? This is what our, con our, 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 um, our conduct is like. When we see the other one doing the other thing, we do the other, we flip it and reverse it. It's not good. So now here with you, as long as I was standing upright, he says, 
you were reclining. And now that I recline, you stand upright. Why do you got to show off in front of everybody and do the opposite and make me look like a schmentrick? Right? What are you doing? We're two teachers. We're two rabbis. Here we are with our students. It's time for evening prayers. And you're, you're making it. You're shouting at me in the middle of Shabbat services, right? And now you're shouting at me in the middle of Shabbat services. It's like the same image that we get uh, from, the, from the terrible joke. To which he replies, I've acted according to the rule of Beit Hillel, right? I can do this however I want, whenever I want. And you have acted according to the rule of Beit Shammai, where you must recline. He immediately says, no, 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 I'm not being a shmendrick. I'm following this way of understanding Jewish life, that there's multiple ways of doing it, and you have your way, and I happen to follow this way, or I follow this way, and you happen to follow that way. And what is more, I had to do this. It was imperative that I did this because lest the disciples, lest our students see this and fix, like they uh, affirm and make, uh, make concrete the halakha, the Jewish law, as so for future generations. Because if I had also sat down and both of us were reclining, our students would have thought that we both do the things the way that Beit Shammai does them, where you have to sit down for the Shema. And we know, as I said earlier, that Beit Hillel is who we follow more often, which is that you can do it many different ways. So not only am I not trying to disrespect you and do things that are like obnoxious, I'm actually doing this to prove that Jews do things different ways. That's a nice text. We take that, te that joke, right, of the Jews arguing about which is right, which is right, what's the tradition, what's the tradition, the tradition is arguing. Absolutely. These two rabbis are like engaged in this battle in a way, a battle of wits, not a, you know, they're not angry with each other. With that amazing parable of like, eh, it's a nice beard, eh, cut it off. To make sure that you know that sometimes we have to do different things to be Jews in the way that we're Jews. Um, I want to open, I'm going to stop the share for a minute uh, and open the floor for some comments uh, or questions really quick. We'll take like one or two, just a, just a quick couple, uh, because I want to share with you uh, another text. Does anybody have any questions or comments or uh, things that you liked or disliked about that text? I saw Roz Klein scratch her head. Toby Halpern, yes, Tobola. I love when you call me Tobola. It reminds me of my grandma. Thank you. If we took this, this relativism to heart, then all Jews could be seen as needing to be more tolerant of other Jews. I mean, oh, so that we wouldn't say those Orthodox are too extreme, or those conservative are too observant, or, and the flip side is the Orthodox or conservative could say we're too liberal. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It's a beautiful thought. I like it. That's the thing I like about that joke, right? Everyone was in shul. Everybody was there arguing and yelling. That makes me happy as the rabbi, right? The new rabbi, like everyone's there. Any other comments, thoughts? All right. Rabbi Glickman gave it a thumbs up. I'm glad. Um, great. So what's, what's really nice about that text, too, is if you look at the two characters, um, Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, we, we, they actually have the same teacher, right? And um, Rabbi Ishmael throughout the Talmud is known for his teachings about peace, peace amongst people, amongst brethren, about, amongst groups. So it's, it's really like a, not only is it this great text for us, but it's also a great insight into the kind of rabbi that he was and, and the Torah that he taught. Um, you know, I, I just picture it like the road trip with the students and they're like crashed on the floor together, you know, and having they had a little schnapps at dinner and they're like, what are you doing? You, you stood up. And it's like, it's the joke that we tell all these, you know, a thousand years later. Uh, sorry, 2000 years later. It's, it's pretty spectacular. So I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, I think we have time to get to the second text. Rabbi, how much time do I have? I stopped paying attention. He's doing math. <laughs> no, but I'm trying to remember when I stopped, and I think I stopped at 8.35, right? All right, well, I'll do this one quick then. Okay. We want to make sure that Rabbi Elaine gets to teach, so I'll be quick. All right, so friends, tw uh, 19 pages later in uh, Babylonian Talmud in Brachot, 
we come upon this. A similar question, a similar argument. Uh, how is one to say it, the Talmud asks. What is it that they're asking, how do you say? Tefillat Haderach, the traveling prayer, which you know, may we be blessed as we go on our way. Right? That is a modern version of an ancient prayer that one would say as they head out on a journey. So how, the, the Talmud is having this argument, not about the Shema, do you stand up or sit down? But how do you say it? Do you say it standing? Do you say it on the road? Like, what, what do you do with this prayer? It's a Filah Haderach, the prayer for traveling. So Rav Chista, uh, one of the rabbis, Rav Chista, he says you say it standing still. That before you head on a journey, you should stop, stand in your tracks, put your feet together, get centered, and say the prayer asking God to protect you on your way. And Rav Sheshet, who's Rav Chista's buddy, again, they're uh, uh, companions in study. They argue with each other a lot. Rav Sheshet says, yeah, 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 you can say it like that. And you can also say it when you start your journey. You can say it when you start walking down the road that, you, you know, you say it, but like you're on your journey. So may we, we be blessed as we go on the, our way that we're already on. You don't have to do it before you go. Nice. You don't have to like stop your car, get out, say the prayer, standing still, and then get back in and go. You can say it while you're driving down the road. So there they are. These two rabbis also on a road trip together. I can imagine, you know, on their way to Woodstock or, you know, to have a nice Shabbat dinner before uh, Janis Joplin played or whatever it was. Rav Chista and Rav Sheshet are going along together. They're on the road. They're on their way. They're actually on horseback is more realistic. Uh, when um, uh, Rav Chista stand still to say this prayer. Stand still on the way. Very practical, yes. Uh, so he stands still on the way and he says the prayer, right? He stops doing, and Rav Sheshet, who's blind, we find out in the Talmud, can't see his buddy, and think about this, can't read the Talmud, has memorized biblical verse after biblical verse and Mishnah after Mishnah, Midrash after Midrash, who is a walking, living, breathing library of Judaica, of just all of the texts, says, what just happened? I hear my buddy offering the prayer. The horses have stopped their footsteps. There's no more kaklon, kaklon, kaklon. What's going on? And he asks, you know, his driver, the guy who's riding, driving his horse and says, what is Rav Chista doing? He says, he stopped to pray. He's standing and praying, he replies. So when Rav Chista says, I'm sorry, uh, Rav Sheshit says, place me in a position that I also may pray. All right. So going back to the top really quick, Rav Sheshit said, you can say it while you're standing still and you can say it while you're proceeding. You can do either one. But Rav Chista, he was the one that said you can only stand at saying. So Rav Chista is following the way that he always does things. Right. Rav Sheshit then says this great line at the end, which I love so much. Place me in the position also that I may pray. For if you can be good, do not be called bad. Do the right thing. Make sure that what you're doing is right and good and just and moral and important and has action to it so that you are not called bad. So that someone doesn't witness you, you know, bad mouthing the way the other one is arguing unnecessarily, putting them down for the, but rather doing the thing that connects you to God and tradition and faith. And for what he does is he stops on the road and offers the prayer side by side with his companion, even though they had different ways of approaching. It. So I think what Toby said was really on point, right? Not only would it be better, you know, it would be great if we could be, you know, and all Jews could be, you know, more like brothers and sisters, that would be wonderful. But also that there's things that we do and we don't dismiss things. We don't ignore that there's things to be done, that there's prayers to be offered, that there's holidays to be celebrated, that there is, is life Jewishly to be lived because of a disagreement. We still do what we do. We go about things the way that we go about them because that's what being a Jew is all about. To quote my esteemed colleague, teacher, and friend, Rabbi Brenner J. Glickman, Judaism is a get up and do religion. And both these texts, that's what's underneath it is there's all this stuff to be done, to be prayed, to be said, to be learned, to be journeyed, right? You can argue about it all you want, but that doesn't excuse you from getting up and doing. So I'm glad you're here to learn with us because that, my friends, is staying up late and doing, learning some, some text for Shavuot. Uh, we have time for one comment. If anybody has one comment, thank you for the, the hand claps. Anybody?
Adrian, is that a hand clap or a hand raised? That's a clap, I guess. Dan, I saw that you unmuted. Did you want to share something? Just um, Buddhism, I think, and instead of two different ways, is an eightfold path to nirvana, right? There's many different ways, but the end result is what you try to all achieve together. Right, absolutely. And if you dig deeper in the Talmud, even in these passages, there's other ways of when and how to say the Shema and other ways of traveler's prayer. Like there's a whole bunch, right? So you, can you say it on a boat? Can you say it on a horse? Standing on a horse is all this great stuff. Um, but you know, the two and two works really nice with the two stories in combination and in tandem. And it works well with the bad joke at the beginning. So I wish you all a Chag Sameach, uh, a good Shavuot. May you receive much Torah this holiday and throughout your lives. Thank you. And it is my distinct honor, unless Rabbi, you want to introduce our, our well, esteemed- Well, no, we're going to give everybody a minute. A break. And then we're and on for the headliner. We're a break, because Rabbi Elaine Rose Glickman, the anchor, uh, and the featured performance uh, after the warm-up acts <laughs> is about to begin in one minute. Uh, if you need to go get a glass of water or get what you need to go, or you can uh, unmute and chit-chat. Uh, we're having a little break. And if you're sitting down, stay seated. And if you're standing up, stay standing. <laughs> well played. And you're sitting and dancing. Yeah. Spilkies. Rabbi, you weren't in LA yet, or you were already gone, I mean. Sorry, not yet. When I got this cup, I believe. 1984 Los Angeles Olympics Cup. Ooh. Bought a Coke at some event and kept the plastic cup and still have it many years later. When they say reduce, reuse, and recycle, I've definitely reused this one. <laughs> wow. While we're waiting, Rabbi Shepherd, did you check the number of letters in the Torah? I have not. Yeah, I believe, but it's, was it 603550 was the population? I think so. So that actually adds up, the 55 five is like 10, so 603 plus 10 is 613. Look at you with the gematria. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I like that. I like that Dan is bringing Torah study back to uh, our evening study. I like it. Is Rabbi Elaine ready? Should we begin? Oh, no, wait, we gotta get her, um, we gotta make her co-host. Oh, something. goodness, please, I'm on it. Here you go. Hey. Oh. Hi, can everybody hear me? Does that work? You sound phenomenal. Thank you. Um, it said that you disabled screen sharing though, and I'm gonna need to share my screen at some point. But oh, I got gotcha. you. Thank you. All set up. You are excellent. Thank you. Good. Hi, everyone. Hug some Maya. I'm so happy to be with you. And I know it's after nine, so thank you for sticking around. Um, these are hard rabbis to follow, but I'm happy to um, to get to be with all of you and to get to study. My text that is my favorite text. <laughs> is really short, um, but I think it's really beautiful and I hope you will also. I learned it from um, my teacher, Rabbi Judith Abrams, who was one of the foremost rabbis, not just um, foremost women, um, but really one of the foremost rabbis to sort of popularize um, the study of Talmud. And I learned this text from her and I love it. Um, and I hope you will as well. So I'm gonna see if I can figure out can you guys see it? Did I share it properly? Not yet. Not yet. All right. Let's see what I can do here. Share screen. Oh, I think I'm doing it. How did that go? Yep. Yay. Okay, Wait. Good. There it is. Rabbi Yochanan. Thank you. I've learned so much. Uh, my daughter's like, shouldn't you know more about Zoom by now? And indeed, I should. But here we go. This is a passage from the very first page of the Talmudic tractate Ta'anit, Ta'anit, which means fast. And here it is. 
Rabbi Yochanan taught, God holds three keys that God does not entrust to any messenger. The key to rain, the key to childbirth, and the key to the resurrection of the dead. I'm going to read it again because it's short and I love it so much. Rabbi Yochanan taught, God holds three keys that God does not entrust to any messenger. The key to rain, the key to childbirth, and the key to the resurrection of the dead. Now, this passage, this is just my commentary. This passage comes at the very beginning of the Talmudic tractate Ta'anit, and it occurs in the context during discussion of where and why to include a blessing that praises God as the one who makes the rains fall. So in the midst of this spirited discussion, why do we praise God as the one who makes the rains fall? And where um, should we place that blessing in our prayer service? Out of that discussion, all of a sudden, Rabbi Yochanan pipes up, God holds three keys that God does not entrust to any messenger, the key to rain, the key to childbirth, and the key to the resurrection of the dead. So I'm going to throw this out for about a minute or two. Um, I invite you to think about this, and I invite you to share your thoughts um, on these three items. Why might this blessing, the blessing of rain, have been of such importance to our sages? What is the relationship between rain and childbirth? Rain and the resurrection of the dead childbirth and the resurrection of the dead and what do you believe is holy that is completely in god's power and what powers are given over to humanity now i recognize we could talk about any of these for an hour um, but i'm just throwing all of them out at once if you want to put answers in the chat if you want to think them to yourself um, or if you want to raise your hand pick the one question of the three that you think is the most significant um, and pick one that you'd like to offer a brief answer. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts um, either out loud or in the chat or um, you know, you can share them with me another time, whatever you'd like. Um, could I ask you please Rabbi Sheffrin and Rabbi Glickman if you would help me, you know, people are raising their hands, just help me call on people and unmute them. Thank you. If anybody wants to share, please. Uh, Dan Aminoff has his hand up. Thank you, Dan. So I'm just curious. I mean, I, I know about the prayer for rain. I know about the prayer for resurrection of the dead, because that's in the Amidah. But is there a prayer for childbirth? And if not, yeah. maybe that's the special one. That's beautiful. That's a really good question. Um, when we talk, and it's interesting because, right, the prayer for um, rain and the prayer for the resurrection of the dead, um, they are, they do, they are found, spoiler alert. Um, in the second blessing of the Amidah, um, which is also known as a blessing, Givarut, praising God's might, right? Um, in Reform tradition, interestingly, we have sort of come to identify the first blessing of the Amidah in a way um, as a blessing of childbirth, because in inserting Sarah um, in many congregations, we say, Magen Abraham, the shield of Abraham. Um, some say Ezrat Sarah, the help of Sarah. But some say um, Puked Sarah, who remembers um, Sarah and traditionally remembers Sarah in childbirth. So that's a really um, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Thank you. Other questions or comments or anything like that? Um, I want to amplify something that Adrian Hutt wrote, um, which I think is like striking. When we think about like sort of the commonalities between the three, she said rain and childbirth promote the continuation of humanity is what she wrote in the chat. And if we think about resurrection of the dead, it does as well, right? That like there's more life that is, you know, given and birthed and grows uh, that are all connected. I was just really, I just wanted to amplify her statement. I thought that was so profound. Beautiful. Thank you, Adrian and Rabbi Sheffrin. And I'm looking at the chat now. I see Elizabeth said, alike all phenomena of nature. Beautiful. And then she goes on to say, but resurrection is mystical, unlike the other two. So thank you. I like that very much also. Any other thoughts or comments on any of the questions? In that case, we shall continue. I think um, I do want to amplify also, uh, oh, wait, Roz. I see Roz and Lieberman raised your hand. I'm sorry, Roz, I didn't see you. There we go. That's okay. <laughs> Thank um, you, Roz. 
I don't know whether I'm on or not. You um, are, we can hear you. Oh, good. Uh, my one thought was with resurrection of the dead, you're also talking about an agrarian society when you plant seeds and sometimes things go to seed by themselves and with the aid of some water and whatnot, they then grow up. It's almost like they've been resurrected. Beautiful. I love that. Thank you to think about the resurrection. I do want to bring up, it reminds me not just about what you're saying um, about the agriculture, which is also true, um, but the idea that, you know, to understand what seems as Elizabeth says, such a mystical um, concept, but to think of the resurrection of the dead in the sense of reminding us about agriculture, um, our sages also said, when you see someone, and we should be thinking about this post-COVID, when you see someone whom you haven't seen for 90 days, what is a blessing you say? If it's been only 30 days, you say Shekhyanu. But if it's been 90 days, you say Baruch Atah Adonai Mechayeh Hameitim. Blessed are you Adonai who resurrects the dead. So what we think of as a mystical you know, concept and what in many ways in the Talmud, um, our sages did as well. There is a way sort of, as Ra says, it just reminded me, our sages said too, sort of to bring that concept more into our everyday life, whether it's an agricultural life or whether it's just sort of the rhythms um, of our of our lives and our society. I see- Frank has his hand up. Oh, great, thank you. Oh, I was just wondering in this context, what we understood the word he to mean. I, I'm sorry, I heard what we understand, the word, and then I didn't hear the word, though, that you said. He. What do we understand? Oh. I mean, the key to childbirth. It, it means pretty literally key. Um, I'll go down where I included the um, Hebrew, or I guess you could say the Aramaic, um, here in Ta'ani. Sorry, don't read the English because it goes ahead. Um, but here, it's Maftechot. Um, <laughs> which means pretty literally key. Mavteach, it's the same word that we use in modern Hebrew also. But we're going to get to a really important point um, about that word. Um, so if we don't have any comments, actually, I might use, um, Frank, your question is sort of the um, transition um, into the next part of our learning. Any other last comments or anything before we move on? Um, Dan or Cindy, I think I see movement on your screen. Uh, so, I mean, that word really means opening. So rain, you open the skies, you open the woman's womb. What happens with resurrection? What are you opening? I'm so glad you asked because we are going to get to that in just a moment too. The continuation of this passage, um, and we're gonna continue reading the rest of the page Ta'ani A going into Ta'ani B. By the way, when you have um, pages of Talmud, it's not like you just have two and then three because it was written as a folia, right? So you have two A is like one page on, but then you turn it over and it's B. So there's two A on one side, you turn the page and then the um, other side. So it's like, you know, when you do two sided copies now, instead of saying page two, page three, B, two A, two B. So this is gonna continue um, two A and two B. And we're going to see that Rabbi Yohanan is going to use a rhetorical advice that's called Gezer Shava. So basically his classmates or fellow disciples are gonna say, what, where do you get this from? Where does this come from? What are you talking about with the key? What do you mean by the key? Where does this come from? And he is going to use what's called a proof text. He's going to go back into the Torah, back into the Bible, and he's going to find texts that prove his point. And the, the device he uses, you see this throughout the Talmud, is called Gezera Shava which means literally an equal cutting, an equal cutting. Now, what does that mean? An equal cutting. It means if I have a word that occurs here and that same word occurs somewhere else, those verses, those teachings must somehow be related. So how are we going to prove that there is a key in the first place and that it is a key to reign, a key to childbirth, in a key to the resurrection of the dead. How are we going to do that? We are going to use, as we learned, our word mafteah. And as we have the word mafteah, as Dan said, the root is patah, is to open. So if you have the word mafteah, meaning key, which has the root patah open, if you want to prove relationships, 
among these, what might seem these various items among rain, childbirth, and the resurrection of the dead, what do you need to do? You need to prove that they have something in common, some word in common. Once you find a common word in each of the Bible's description of these three concepts, you can use that equal cutting, that similar word to fashion a relationship among the three. So what is Rabbi Yochanan going to do? He's going to find three passages that use the word patah or open, which is the root of mafteah, of key. So all he needs to do is to find three passages that refer to childbirth, rain, and the resurrection of the dead that use the word patah. So here he's going to find them. The first one, the key of rain. How do we know that only God has a key to rain? Because the key of rain, as it is written, the Lord will open for you, patah, the Lord will open for you, God's good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain of your land in its due time. Who's going to do this opening? Specifically, the Lord will open. The Lord will open, the Lord patah. God, it doesn't say someone else will open for you, treasure. It says God will open, God will open, God will patah. Therefore, God must have mafteah, God must have that key to give the rain in your land in the due time. Great. So we've got rain. What about childbirth? Remember in Genesis, when Rachel complains to Jacob that she doesn't have children, and Jacob, maybe not the most sensitive man in the world, says, you know, why are you bothering me? I'm not in charge. I'm not in charge of whether you have children or not. You know, basically God's in charge. You know, go like, don't bother me. You know, it's not my responsibility. But what do we see? That basically the Torah agrees, the key of child as it's written, and God remembered Rachel and listened to her because she was crying out that she wanted to bear a child and God opened her womb. Torah is saying, you're right. Jacob, you were right. That key to childbirth, patah, the ability to open a womb, the opening, that is only given over to God. It was God who remembered Rachel, God who listened to her, and God who opened her womb. Patah, God opened her womb. Mafteah, God controls the key to childbirth. And finally, whoops, got a little over eager here with my screen sharing. The key of the resurrection of the dead. And this might sound familiar if you're not a, you know, um, whatever, habitual reader of Ezekiel. Um, we do read this every year um, in our um, Yom Kippur service. The key of the resurrection of the dead, as it is written, and you shall know, this is in Ezekiel's valley um, of dry bones, a vision of the dry bones, when there are these dry bones and Ezekiel says, um, your God says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says to God, oh God, you alone know. And God allows the bones to return together, puts the flesh of sinews upon them. And we read um, Ezekiel, it says, and they rose up a very great host. And then God basically says, this is just a preview of what I'm going to do. You shall know, people, you shall, Ezekiel and all of our people, you shall know that I am the Lord when, when I have opened your graves, patak. When I've cut off, when I've opened your graves, I alone, there's no one else who's going to be opening these graves, patak, it's only God. Therefore, as God is the only one who can patak, open these graves, God is the only one, maftak, who controls the key to the resurrection of the dead. So that's how we see the use of Gezer Shava, this equal cutting, that we have one word, maftak, key with the root patak, open and three different passages in the Bible show have this word opening. Therefore, we're able to link together the key to rain belongs only to God, the key to childbirth belongs only to God, and the key of the resurrection of the dead belongs only to God. So I have a teeny little bonus if there's time, but I totally understand if there's not time. But does anybody have any questions or comments or anything like that? We can open it up for a minute or two um, and yeah. Anybody has questions or comments or any insights? I would love to hear them. Adrian Hutt. I do. Adrian Hutt, thank you. Thank you. So are there any other passages or are these the only three? Um, I don't understand. The only passages that have to do with rain and childhood and resurrection opening. of the dead? That have to do with opening. 
Oh, no, there are other ones too. No, I mean, we see the word open occur, you know, other places um, in the Bible, but it's just not being used right now. You know, that those are not the ones that are, um, those aren't the ones in which Rabbi Yochanan has interest. Um, but that's true with all of the equal cutting. That's true with every time there's a, gizir, a gizir Shava. Like if you, you know, you because you want to pick just the right ones, right? You want to kind of, you know, cherry pick. You want to pick and choose. So God can hold the key to other things other than rain and childbirth. I'm so excited. Okay, yes. And if no one has any additional comments, Adrian, it's like you're a shill because that leads exactly <laughs> to the next part. So I'm going to everybody remember Adrian's brilliant transition there. Um, I mean, don't be intimidated. The other comments, I want to hear them too. But um, Adrian, yes, that is going to take us into that little part that I wanted to add. But um, any other comments, I would love to hear them. Dan Aminoff, you've got the floor. Dan Aminoff. Um, just, um, you, you open the sky and you get rain, that's good for man. You open the womb and you get a baby, that's good for Jacob. You open the graves and the gray mass comes out and you know the Lord is God. But does it do anything for the dead? Of course, you get to live again, my gosh. I can't wait to get resurrected. And for, Ezek and for Ezekiel, he gets an army. <laughs> oh, is that it? <laughs> the zombie army. Well, no, I mean it's, it's it's like it's the vision there, but um, no, I mean I think you know it's not accidental, right? That the blessing for the resurrection of the dead occurs in the context of um God's power. You know, the blessing that praises God's power. So yeah, I mean the idea like life is so precious and so beautiful that of course you want to be resurrected. And of course, traditionally, the resurrection of the dead takes place in the messianic time. And who, I mean, you don't want to miss messianic time. Like that's going to be amazing. Um, but in the meantime, the belief in the resurrection of the dead, I think it is to kind of give hope for us as human beings, but it's also an affirmation of God's power. Like if God can resurrect the dead, I mean, God can do anything. There is no limit to God's giver rote, um, you know, to God's strength, to God's power. Other thoughts or comments or anything? All right, then Adrian, I'm so glad you said that. Is there anything else that can open? Yes, in fact, because Tani, that we just read, that is from the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is kind of, Believe it or not, there's two versions of Talmud. There's a Jerusalem Talmud and Babylonian Talmud. And you would think today that the Jerusalem Talmud is like the premier Talmud, that that's the one you want. But actually, in ancient times, the Babylonian community actually was better known and was seen as more authoritative, if you can believe such a thing. So the passage we just read comes from the Babylonian Talmud. But in the Babylonian Talmud, they don't only record the beliefs and the teachings of rabbis in Babylonia, they also, you know, they give some credit to the rabbis um, in what they call the West. Now, it's jarring for us to say the West is Israel because for us it's East. But remember, if you're living in Babylonia, Israel is actually to the West of you. So the passage continues, in the West, in Eretz Israel, they say, the key of livelihood is also in God's hand. So where it's a Babylonian tradition that God holds the key of rain, childbirth, and the resurrection of the dead, they give voice here to an additional tradition in the West, in Eretz Yisrael, where they also say the key of livelihood is also in God's hand. And how do they prove, mafteach, that the key to livelihood is in God's hand? They bring up, just as Adrian said, well, here's another passage where the word patach, open, is used. And in Psalms, this is part of Ashrei, um, for those who are familiar with it, you open your hand. God, you open your hand and satisfy every living thing with favor. Who opens your hand? Human beings don't open their hands. God, you open your hand. Only God opens God's hand, open, therefore, and satisfy every living thing with favor. Therefore, the key to satisfying every living thing with favor, the key of livelihood, that, that mafteach, that key is only in God's hand. So you say, huh, all right, so there's this tradition in Israel so someone turns probably and says like, you know, gives Rabbi Yochanan a little poke. It's like, hi, you know, you think you're this great Babylonian rabbi. In Israel, in the West, they also say the key of livelihood is in God's hand. Why did you only come up with three? But Rabbi Yochanan is not to be deterred. What is the reason Rabbi Yochanan did not consider the key of livelihood in his list? Rabbi Yochanan could have said to you, if it was worth your time, he would have said, 
Rain is the same as livelihood in this regard. Rain is indispensable to all livelihoods. Basically, Rabbi Yochanan would have said, oh, there is no reason for this text. You don't need to say the key of livelihood is in God's hand because it's so obvious. If God controls the rain, God controls the livelihood. I just didn't want to bother. I didn't want to take up your time. But that is what we have there. Um, and it just shows also um, the difference. Here's, oh, I didn't bring it here, but the, um, just the fact that what we think of as the Talmud, what we think of as this tradition that is static and rooted and exactly as we've had it for thousands of years, it's not actually true. What we have is a dynamic and a living tradition that even in the authoritative Talmud, it brings in the opinions and the ideas of rabbis who lived in other periods, rabbis who lived in other times. And it's interesting, there is a very similar passage to this, what we see in the Talmud, that comes in a midrashic collection called Devarim Rabbah, a commentary on Deuteronomy. And in the commentary on Deuteronomy, it says almost the same thing, except it says, God holds three keys that God does not entrust to any messenger, the key to rain, the key to barrenness, the key to resolving someone who is infertile, the key to infertility, changing it to fertility, and the key to the resurrection of the dead. Now, does that change the passage's meaning that much? Really not. But it's interesting to see that such a similar tradition had some variances um, as it was carried forward by our people. So that's what we have. God holds three keys that God does not entrust to any messenger, the key to rain, the key to childbirth, and the key to the resurrection of the dead. I love that passage. I hope you liked it too. And that is all I've got. Hav Sameach, my friends. Hooray! Oh, Hooray! great comments in the text. Thank you very much. Um, all three, as Denise says, are about giving life, which people cannot do. Absolutely. Elizabeth asks, is it just the soul that is resurrected? I could talk about that for hours and hours and hours, so I won't. But anybody who wants to talk about resurrection of the dead, love talking about the resurrection of the dead another time. And Lita, thank you. Yes, this imagery is so powerful that keys open these sacred doors to open heaven, to open the womb, and to open the graves. So thank you all for the comments in the chat, and thank you all for studying with me tonight. Thank you. Hagsameach. 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 Hagsameach, everybody. Thank you. Friends, before we say goodnight, uh, two quick announcements on behalf of the temple and a moment of thanks. Uh, first is, if you haven't already filled out your survey that we sent out on Thursday, uh, please find the email from Thursday from the temple. It has a four question survey about your COVID practices that we would like your input on. It literally takes one minute. Please offer one minute of your wisdom for us to glean from. Uh, we wanna make sure to do things as right as we can for our community. Uh, and this is a helpful way to do so. Second thing is tomorrow morning at 1030, please join Rabbi Glickman and myself for our festival morning service. Uh, for Shavuot, which will also include Yisker. Uh, Dan Cartledge will be with us. It's always meaningful and special. Uh, it'll be on live stream at 1030 tomorrow morning. Um, and I also just want to say thank you to you, to you for coming and learning with us and fulfilling the mitzvah of studying Torah, uh, and on, especially on this holiday of Shavuot. And thank you to Rabbi Brenner Glickman and Rabbi Elaine Rose Glickman uh, for their beautiful teachings and Torah. Uh, I know I learned a lot and enjoyed it, and I'm sure we all did. And Barney, and Barney for your Torah, too. Barney, your Torah is delicious. Hi, Barney. Hi, Barney. Oh, Hi, Barney. Barney was quiet. You didn't have to give him a spotlight. <laughs> He's just too cute. Um, so, friends, uh, this will formally, unless the, the, either of the other rabbis have anything they want to add. After party. <laughs> the after party. There may be cheesecake. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. So this will formally conclude our session. So if you're going to bed like a sensible person, great. And if you're staying up late to learn, hooray. Hey, Barbara. You're muted, though. It looked like you were saying something. Can I ask a question? To get this switch. Everett Gendler, I'm glad you found your way here. I was trying to send you the link by email. Hey, Barbara, you're on now. I just want to say thank you. This was wonderful.
Thank you, Rabbi. See you All tomorrow right. night. <laughs> okay. Yay. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Hey, Roz. Hi. I was talking to a colleague and mentioned that we have a board meeting tomorrow night. They were like, you don't hold by two days? <laughs> no. Thanks for that wonderful, putting together that wonderful pr program this afternoon. It was very meaningful. Oh. Thank you. We're so glad everybody liked it. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Roberta and Frank. Amen.